From the European Parliament in Brussels, this is Raw Politics. Thank you for joining us tonight, and this is what we have for you on the program, Ibiza Gate, how a corruption scandal that brought down Austria's government could affect EU elections, rally wars, thousands take to the streets for and against nationalism ahead of the EU vote. No laughing matter. Comedian-turned-politician Vladimir Zelensky is sworn in as Ukraine's president, hitting the road. The last leg of Yuri News' epic election road trip comes to Germany. And election zen. Why India's prime minister is meditating in a cave in tonight's Raw Moment. Thank you for joining us. Now, it is time to meet our panelists for this evening. We have Darren McCaffrey, our political editor at Your News. Darren, which of these stories are you watching? Well, you and I spend an awful lot of time talking to politicians, but in the end, actually, elections are about people and how they feel. And actually, uh, later on, we're going to see some of that. Your News likes to pride itself on kind of all views, all voices. And we're going to get a, a genuine kind of spectra of views from across uh, Europe and get to the concerns hmm. that will lead people to make those choices this week. And weekend. there is a wide range out there. All right, uh, joining us also is Theresa Kuschler. She is a Swedish journalist from Svenska Dagbladet. Theresa, which of these stories are you watching closely tonight? The rally wars. I'd like to okay. see who gets to rule the streets and whose voices are heard the most for or against nationalism. I'm very... Uh keen on that topic. That we shall see. Okay, and also joining us, Oliver Grimm. He's a Brussels correspondent for the Austrian newspaper Die Presse. Which of these stories are you watching? I think we can guess, Oliver. Uh, well, it has to do with a, with a Mediterranean island called Ibiza and the downfall <laughs> of the Austrian government over mm. some videos that were released about the uh, former vice-chancellor behaving in a very silly way. Big story today, and that is exactly where we're beginning tonight, because Austria is in a political upheaval after its coalition government collapsed over the so-called Ibiza gate, as Oliver was saying. The scandal started with a video published by German media. Now, in that footage, former Vice Chancellor Heinz Christian Strache from the far-right Freedom Party appears to offer state contracts to a woman posing as a Russian oligarch's niece. Shortly after the video was released, Strache resigned, but denied breaking the law. Austrian Chancellor Sebastian Kurz has now called for snap elections in September and announced a full investigation into the incident. Ich bin hier mit dem Bundespräsidenten in Kontakt und wir teilen hier die Meinung, dass alles getan werden muss, um alle Verdachtsmomente, die hier im Raum stehen, teilweise strafrechtlich möglicherweise relevant, teilweise nicht, aber moralisch trotzdem verwerflich, dass die vollkommen aufgeklärt werden müssen. All right, Oliver, let's uh, start with you. I mean, this is a bombshell, and w the timing is awful for some and great mm. for, the, uh, for others. I mean, but the effect is the collapse of the Austrian government. Can you give, give us some context on how big and bad this is for the government? Well, I mean, it's, it's as bad as it could be because the government is going to... Well, the government is collapsing as we talk. Uh, the only question is now, how is it going to collapse? Is there going to be a caretaker government? How, how are they going to be appointed? Because the ministers of the FPÖ the right-wing party uh, that Mr. Strache uh, was the head of uh, have threatened to resign. Mr. Kurz doesn't actually want to continue with them anyway. So there might be a situation where, until we have new elections at the beginning of September, there will be some sort of caretaker government formed by experts, high ministerial officials, which would be a novelty for Austria. Is We've there a sense that. of shock from the government side? Like, they weren't expecting this. They, um, they didn't see this coming. The thing is, uh, Kurz himself knew 24 hours before it was published. Okay. So it took him 48 hours for his first public statement. He hasn't so far taken a single question on it. He's only mm. given statements. Mm. So that gives you an idea of how profoundly it has affected him. But he has immediately, as soon as he started talking publicly, turned it into a campaign prop and said sure. that, you know, you know, he can't go on and... He's covering his bases as well. And, so, you know, traveling. Just, just very quickly on this, why, why September? Why can they not have an election next month? Uh, well, I'm not going to bore you with all the procedural uh, but it legal takes reasons, time. but yeah. basically we never have elections during, during summer, during the holidays, okay. which is, I think, a good idea. <laughs> so, take a break, who's going to be there? And then, and then you, you, you have all kinds of constitutional reasons why, I mean, you have to de declare the list of candidates sure. and publish that. And I mean, this is playing out in yeah. Austria in one way, but what's interesting also is how it's playing out in Russia. I mean, it's being, you know, they called it, uh, the media, they called it a trap to sour relations with Moscow mm. and uh, mm. called Shaka a promising politician. I mean, that's interesting, isn't it, to see... <laughs> that side of the story well, as well. The story has all the elements of a fantastic uh, spy novel or a film. It has the femme fatale luring the uh, controversial politician into a situation where... Oh, 
it, it is on a Mediterranean island. island. <laughs> of course, where else? I mean, and and and, and the other thing is nobody knows like, who, who was filming no. it at this point. Yes. And I think um, what's interesting is on a broader scale the impact of it. People are looking, had looked at Kurtz's government as, oh, this is the way to work with the far right. What does that mean now, Darren? Yeah, I think there's several ramifications to this. First of all, you're right. We don't quite know, and it doesn't even seem like the publications, the newspapers who publish these videos on Friday know who quite was behind this sting operation, and indeed why something that was filmed over two years ago, around two years ago, has only just come to light uh, now, and that is a still, a, still well. a mystery. Mm. Um, I think to add to your point, uh, there are lots of ramifications for this. Uh, first of all, uh, yeah, there'll clearly be ramifications when it comes to regards to Russia and how that is viewed uh, there. Uh, for the security services in a country that has already, to a degree, been isolated because of mm. previous incidents, mm. Austria will be further isolated amongst the intelligence community, uh, whether in places from Germany to France to the UK and the United States. Mm. Um, and, of course, they'll still try to make political capital out of this, uh, particularly centrist parties. We've already seen uh, the French economy minister today, Angela Merkel, mm -hmm. talking about, again, the danger of nationalism. That's and one of the dangers, you're right, that is rhetoric. that Sebastian Kurz has constantly tried to argue, at least, that in some ways to try and quell the populist right, you need to bring them in, but then get them into government... This potentially is a sign that that strategy... And he did work. also defend what their government had been able to do in, in the, the, the months that they have been in a coalition. All right, let's uh, go over to Vienna. We are joined by Austrian Green MEP uh, and Raw Politics regular uh, Thomas uh, Waits. Thanks for joining us there. We know you're busy uh, campaigning, so good, good of you to be on the show. Can you tell us um, the reactions uh, there in Vienna on the ground? How, have, how has, has this been going down with people? Well, there's a big outrage about what was happening, especially the question how parties are financed, where are they getting the money from, how are they hiding uh, illegal party financing. This is one of the cases that is heavily discussed here. And also how a chancellor courts can actually present himself as the person uh, uh, serving the country with stability. He was the one handing over the interior minister and the defense minister to this party. Uh, and I mean, just imagine uh, what we've seen. This party was ready to sell to a fake Russian oligarch niece. Uh, what do we think they would be or have been? Let's see. I mean, uh, what would they sell to real Russian interests uh, in case they could? So uh, there's a huge outrage here. Uh, citizens are really concerned whether they can trust politics at all uh, and what kind of game is played here. And, uh, Thomas, you're talking about the outrage, and clearly this is damaging, has been damaging for the government. But what about for the Greens? Is this um, something that you can uh, benefit from? You can benefit from this scandal? <laughs> Well, overall, I mean, any political party is not benefiting if trust in politics as such is lost. I mean, we as citizens have to be able to trust their representatives, uh, no matter what party they're from, that they serve the interests of the country. And seeing that uh, a political party and leaders of a political party are ready to sell the interests of the public just uh, for their sake of, of their own power uh, or maybe income of their party, uh, this creates huge concern into uh, the trustfulness of politics as such. So if you're talking about a lack of trust in politicians, do you think this will have direct impact on the actual voting in the European elections? They just kind of go, what's the point? Yes, exactly. I mean, uh, Austrian Freedom Party is not the only right-wing populist party that is running for the elections. It's not the only right-wing populist party that openly uh, talks about their good relations to Russia. Uh, so I think the question how parties finance themselves is a European one. We should ask that question to any party uh, that runs for the European Parliament, especially to the right-wing populists. They should openly declare who is financing them. We have these cases not only in Austria, also Salvini's party. Uh, is there uh, uh, under suspicion, I would say. Uh, also, other parties like Mr. Farage's party openly uh, gets money from Russian sides. So uh, declare openly who is actually financing you. Otherwise, we will lose trust of European voters as well. All right, thank you for that. Uh, Thomas Waits, Greens MEP, they're talking to us from Austria. Okay, I'll go back to you, Oliver. So, you know, he was talking, he was talking about the outrage. Yeah, now, but how would this impact, as I asked him, on election, on the election behavior of, of people? Um, and, yeah, how, how, how will it manifest itself? I, I, I think I would only venture to say two things. There's only been one poll since the scandal broke. That poll showed that Kurtz is 
gaining a bit. I think he's at 36 or 38. The FPÖ is suffering, but not too much. I think they're at 16 or 18 percent. Uh, the SPÖ, the Social Democrats, are at 26. So overall, it hasn't had that huge impact Why that not? people expect. Or is it too early? I think, first of all, it's too early. And then I think a scandal like that, several days before an election, only has an effect. It doesn't really convince anybody to vote for someone. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't have voted for anyway. It's only there to rally your troops. So mm -hmm. to make sure to, to, you know, to activate your base, to really go out and turn out the vote. Mm -hmm. Or it might deter people from actually voting. And especially the FPÖ has many people mm -hmm. uh, who only from vote occasionally. All, yeah, mean. so they might not vote at all. But if I just may add a second mm -hmm. point, in the European Council, I think it'll have a very significant effect because one of the biggest boosters of Manfred Weber, the candidate of the European People's Party for European Commission president, mm -hmm. is Kurz. Mm -hmm. He's weakened now. He's in no position after the elections, which is going to be next week, to make any huge demands. Sure. So he's not going to be there in a position and say, Angela Merkel, Mark Rutte, Emmanuel Macron, I want Weber because the EPP was the first. Uh, what I want to follow uh, on what Darren was saying earlier about the other leaders, as you're saying, mm -hmm. picking up on this, what's happening in Austria, and saying, hey, see, this is what happens when you work with the far right. This is the dangers of working with the far right. You can't trust them. <laughs> but at the same time, does it really affect voters from Germany, for example? Would what's happening in Austria really change your mind about how they're going to vote in Germany or in France? I mean, does that really matter? No, I don't think so. Okay. And I think that's the big problem with, with all these populist rights going together. Mm. You know, we can rally all our troops together from all the countries, yes, but voters in France have no clue about the voters in Italy or the voters in Austria. Mm. I don't think it will affect. I think that for most of, of these kinds of parties in all our countries mm. is that any publicity is good publicity. Mm -hmm. mm. And in this case, we can't point the blame at somebody that we know very closely. We can just look at the Austrians from a, from a distance and say, well, no, they managed to get into government. Well, that's good. We're going to try to do that as well. Mm. And I don't think that's broken by this. Uh, okay. I, I would, I'd slightly disagree on that point because I think mm -hmm. that uh, one of the arguments, of course, that the populists on the far right have constantly made is that they can get into government and that this is part of a wave that we see, you mm. know, not just across Europe, across the world. So, i.e. that there is an effect clearly on voters mm. in other places. And all I would say is I agree that this scandal uh, may not do that much damage in the sense that it will just rally the base. Um, and they will stick, fa stick by their party, but it's the impact it might have on wavering voters or your mm -hmm. ability to attract yeah. other voters. And all I would say about the populist movement is that whether it is Marine Le Pen in France, whether it is Salvini in Italy, mm -hmm. whether it is Nigel Farage in Britain, or indeed now in Austria, this mm -hmm. haze on Donald Trump in the United States of kind of Russian interference is proving very difficult mm -hmm. for the kind of populist far right to shake. And I think that overall narrative will do damage to their ability to attract new voters, to attract the centre-ground right. voters across Europe. All right. Well, on that note, the scandal may have engulfed Austria's far-right Freedom Party over the weekend, but in Milan, there was nothing but support for Europe's nationalist parties. Let's take a look. Viva l'Italia! Vive la France! Et vive les nations d'Europe! Thousands cheered as France's far-right leader Marine Le Pen bellowed from a rainy podium in Milan. Standing alongside Italy's Matteo Salvini and amongst nationalist leaders from 11 other EU countries, the group stood united against Brussels and urged Europeans to join them when voters head to the polls on Sunday. Because we are living a moment historic, so important that we have to do every right to liberate this country and this continent from the occupation abusive organized by Bruxelles in these years. This is a beautiful manifestation of today, which I thank you from the heart, Matteo. It's an act of the revolution pacific and democratic that sees in all the countries the wake of the people. Elsewhere, Europe's cathedrals were also the chosen battleground of pro-EU groups as thousands marched against nationalism and called on the continent to unite. From Poland to Germany, Austria, Spain and more, citizens and politicians marched side by side, asking for unity in the face of division. And finally, it seems the Sweden Democrats are the latest far-right party to find themselves in hot water after two lead candidates were kicked out of the party. Peter Lundgren is accused of touching a colleague's breasts while drunk at a party. Lundgren admitted to the act but said he had, quote, no further intentions. Meanwhile, Christina Winberg, whose state phone conversations confirmed the allegations, is also out of the party and the election. 
The Sweden Democrats accuse her of being disloyal to the party. Okay, Teresa, we'll uh, let you comment on that last story because you were saying Peter Lundgren wasn't. In no, fact. he wasn't. He's, okay. he's still he's the still top the top candidate for the party, and he's endorsed by the leadership. Christina Winberg, the the woman we saw the other, she has been kicked out of the party, and she's off the election list. And this has to do with another tape scandal, not as as <laughs> severe maybe mm -hmm. as the Austrian, but with conversations about one very drunken hotel night with Peter Lundgren mm -hmm. in a room together with these two women, where he touched this this one woman's breast, and he has admitted to right. doing so as well. But he is still top of the So of I can understand, how is the perpetrator of a self-convinced, let's say, misdemeanor, uh, mm. to put it mildly, mm. how, he, how has he got the backing of the party and the person who exposed it yeah. has been kicked out? Surely that's the wrong way around. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, they say with the party, for the party, this has been a misunderstanding, a situation okay. with a party with so maybe a little bit too much alcohol, and there, there's a misunderstanding between two people. Whereas actually, the woman who was admitted, it, it has been clarified. It's been cleared what happened. He touched, he took his hands so, under her sweater. So what about pulled the bra? Oh, so what about? So here's <laughs> another scandal involving yeah. a former uh, politician. Mm. How, how is this all playing into that narrative? Okay, just putting it all those together, what we saw, you have Salvini yeah. gathering, yeah. rallying his troops, mm. the base, and you had the anti-nationalist rallies, and then you have these scandals. Okay, how will that play out? Which you were interested in this? Which of the voices would be winning? With the risk of sounding really old and like a like a mother, I, I I do find it very refreshing that everybody's out in the streets. Everything from youth and climate uh, mm -hmm. activists uh, to actually I don't know, we should, probably shouldn't say it, the populist right, but everybody's out in the streets. How will it play out? Well, the populist seems to get fewer votes than they have uh, than that's been projected uh, as before. Maybe the Austrian scandal has a little bit of a mm. possibility to not weaken them individually, but as a group. As a group. Okay. As a group. I think overall, when you say just, just on this about kind of Donald Trump's draining the swamp, which is something that actually mm. those parties on the right have taken up as a kind of mantra of what needs to be achieved in politics, i.e., taking corruption away mm. um, and getting rid of all the kind of you know the kind of elitist view of politics. Mm. Well, clearly that will do that narrative an sure. awful lot of damage, these scandals. But the mm. problem is, overall, it actually just does politics damage because voters mm. then look at what they see as the old guard of politics, who they think is corrupt. They look at these people who claim they're mm. about to drain the swamp so the and end, they're also probably corrupt. And in the, the end, actually, you know what? Status quo. Everyone loses out, sure. really. And, OK, last word to you, Oliver. Um, what, what, what do you think? Because when we were watching that, you were reacting, you say, oh, mm. dear, <laughs> what does yeah. that mean? The, uh, oh, when we saw the, Sal the Salvini yeah. rally there. Oh, yeah. I mean, no, I, I reacted because I saw Mr. Wilders, who just mm -hmm. one or two years mm -hmm. ago was the big threat coming from the right wing, and I think he's pulling at 4 or 5% now. Mm -hmm. However, the problem that you pointed out is there in the Netherlands as well. You've got uh, Thierry Baudet, who's in com com sort of... Uh, sort of uh, representing a new, mm. fresh face of right-wing authoritarian populism. And I think if we try to simply argue away the fact that many people like this uh, way of visceral f politics from the right, we're not going to win the political debate for, for how to get along with each right. other. It's an instinctive, emotional thing. Mm -hmm. And if we counter it with arguments, I think we're on a, we're on a losing streak. So Indeed, as we see from, from rhetoric yeah. there. OK, we have a lot more coming up for you on the programme. We speak to the European Commission's chief spokesperson, Margarita Skinas, on the Spitzenkandidaten process okay. and how populism can affect the EU elections. Plus, as British voters get ready to head to the polls, the election battleground is being fought on social media. We'll find out who's winning. That's up next. Seventeen point four million people, the greatest democratic exercise in our history, is being overturned by Parliament. That's why I founded the Brexit Party. That's why I'm here today in South End. That's why we're leading the opinion polls. All right, welcome back to the program. That was Nigel Farage, leader of the Brexit Party. The party may be just a few months old, but it is already appearing to be winning the online battle for the EU vote. Alex Morgan and our team in the Cube have been looking into that today. Alex. Like him, loathe him. There's a reason he's smiling, which I think is pretty clear here. This is Nigel Farage, and his fresh-out-of-the-box Brexit party is storming ahead in the UK. Now, why does it all matter when we're talking about the social media campaign trail? Well, it's on social that minds are changed, votes are won or lost, and that these politicians now want to engage with you directly. 
And we're getting a sense now, thanks to the new tools that Facebook introduced after the 2016, you know, election cycles where they were under a lot of pressure to increase their transparency. They have now delivered this. This is the Facebook ad library. This allows you to see who's spending what and where. And the Brexit party, Nigel Farage's Brexit party, well, if you look in the last uh, last 30 days, you can see they are storming ahead in the amount they're spending. This in pounds here, I could tell you roughly 108,000 euros spent on that. Now, that is oh, that's more than four times the amount of money being put into Facebook ads than Theresa May's Conservative Party. Bearing in mind Theresa May here under a lot of pressure over these elections. But also, it's key that when you compare that to many of the other parties as well, you look at the Liberal Democrats, Change UK, the main Remain forces. Yes, if you add them up together, they're spending more than the Brexit Party, but they're not coordinating their campaign. So the Brexit Party, really, you can see them playing social media very effectively. Let's take you to Facebook then. When we look at Facebook, it's not all about the followers. The Labour Party, 103 million followers they have. This data from CrowdTangle, that's a tool that looks at Facebook. But the Brexit Party, just 108,000. But when you want to see how they're using their followers, how they're using their platform, look at this. These are the video views in this election cycle. The Brexit Party, 6.28 million views. Look at that compared to the Labour Party, 1.79. You are seeing here a new party, just a few months old, putting money behind a simple, single message, coordinated campaign. And they are getting eyeballs on their content. This is all key. And it's not just a Facebook story by any means at all. There's a reason I surrounded Mr. Farage in that graphic there with tweets as well. And that is because a really interesting thing is going on on Twitter. Researchers have traditionally said that Twitter is a medium where the left does well, the liberal parties do well. It's certainly where journalists and politicians spend a lot of their time. Let's not forget how we all wait and watch for Donald Trump's tweets. But a really interesting fact here, this is the number of retweets on Twitter. And let's compare this. This is data from the Hansard Society. They say, look at this. This is the Labour Party. And this is the Brexit Party from the 26th of April, sorry, 29th of April to the 6th of May. This and compared to this. These are the numbers of tweets that are then retweeted. That's how you share content on Twitter. The Brexit Party storming ahead. Compare their retweets to Theresa May's Conservative Party. Wow. Now, why does all this matter? Well, Tessa, this is about the battle that is being fought on social media to change minds, to get you out on the day. As a region, Nigel Farrell will be smiling when he sees uh, the numbers for this social media campaign. The question, though, the question we are all wanting to know, and it, no matter how much money we put into Facebook, we won't know until the day, will this impact the vote? All right, thank you for that to Alex and our Cube team. And joining us here in the studio is Jennifer Baker, tech expert and EU policy journalist. And also uh, joining us is Effie Kutsukotsa, our correspondent at Euronews. And so with us, our political editor, Darren McCaffrey. All right, Jennifer, I'll start with you on we're looking at that, uh, uh, what Alex was presenting there. Um, OK, there, one, there is the money that was put into it. But second, there's also the message. It seems like this is such a, an easy, shareable, convincing message. What are they doing right that everyone can't seem to get? Well, I think what they're doing right is that they're quite agile. Um, and Alex has really done a very strong job there in showing the numbers. The other thing we don't know is the story behind those numbers, because just because something is being retweeted or shared doesn't necessarily mean it's getting a thumbs up from the people who are sharing it. You can retweet things with a, my goodness, look at this awful story. So there is that to be, you know. But what they're doing is they're grabbing eyeballs, they're grabbing attention. And this is something we're seeing play out actually across Europe, you know, in, uh, you know, we see Marine Le Pen and, and, and Salvini, all Facebook living mm. their press conferences. We see the AFD in Germany storming ahead in terms of its use of social media. It's kind of the big traditional parties that just don't seem to be able to switch it up a gear and, and really go for the social media. The question is how that will change the vote because mm -hmm. Certainly there are echo chambers, particularly Twitter, as Alex mentioned. It's a lot of politicians and academics and journalists talking to each other. It's not necessarily the man in the street. Yeah, but when, when you say that people who are sharing it don't necessarily agree with the message, I mean, this is where we say that any publicity is good publicity. I mean, is that really the truth for, for, for a lot of the voters? Effie, let me ask you that. When you, when you talk to voters on the street, 
Is that what it is? Mm. Any publicity is good publicity? No, not exactly. This is something, I guess, that uh, mainly it's uh, discussed among the people who are really running uh, for elections or uh, really working on that. But for the people, no, I think it's not. Of course, uh, it's a reality that when you hear many times for someone or something or an idea or a person, it's something that you really keep in mind, even in a bad way. So mm. this, I think that it has uh, an impact on any choice. Mm. Is that what it is? Because you've, you've covered Nigel Farage quite a bit uh, over or in the past over the years, no? I mean, what is the what does he do right that gets people's attention, really? I think there were several factors at play in uh, the UK at the moment during their election campaign, not least of all because the centre two parties, the main two traditional parties... Or is it what they're doing wrong? Uh, uh, well, the other they, two? <laughs> they've vacated the... Essentially, the, they're not on the playing field. Mm -hmm. And so that has, of course, allowed Nigel Farage and the Brexit party, given the fact that Brexit is the defining issue of these elections, to dominate in many ways, not helped by the fact that the Remain campaign is so fractured. Uh, so that might speak to the big figures to a degree. In terms of Nigel Farage, again, you have to remember, I mean, he is one of the most well-known politicians probably now in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, certainly in the UK. And there is this element of the fact that he is just recognised. He's almost kind of a celebrity politician to a degree. Mm -hmm. And people will always kind of gather around that. I remember going campaigning with him. He would attract large crowds of people just by the very fact he was famous is not necessarily because they were going to vote for him. Mm -hmm. uh, and we do have to remember, actually, when it comes to people on the populist far right, uh, that, yes, they do in some ways tend to be very active uh, and politically engaged, some of them, but on the whole, actually, when you get them to turn out, it's mm -hmm. not necessarily translate that easy. Yeah. But there is something much wider here that uh, we've been talking about, which I think is that, actually, the populist far right seem to have engaged far better and quicker uh, with social media and with Facebook and with Twitter yeah. than traditional parties. And I think that is genuinely uh, of concern to those parties because, actually, and that is concern, where people I mean, are and, now living and, their lives. And, and of concern to the European Union. I mean, I think when, when you know, you have the, the Commission, the Council, when they're looking at uh, populist parties or the rise of populism in Europe, they're always asking themselves, so why? Why are they doing so well? What And what impact will it have in the upcoming elections? And Effie, today you did manage to speak uh, to Margarita Siskinas, the spokesperson for the European Commission. S clearly, this is a concern for him. Of course, it's a concern for all the EU establishment or you bubble and he what he said actually is that we have to they didn't do actually so far and it's obvious uh, from the polls uh, that we have to debrusselize uh, the european union to take it That's out a new from term. this uh, yes okay. this is what exactly he told me that <laughs> to take it out from this bubble and that the society Someone kind of contradicting yeah. yourself let's use a word no one's ever heard of in order to try and to make engage people with politics okay yeah, and so, All of right. course, uh, because, you know, when Juncker was elected uh, some five years ago, 2014, what he said actually is that if we don't bring citizens back to and closer to us, mm -hmm. we have failed. So let's see what he said about uh, these concerns that people have and, of course, about uh, the populist parties that we see that they're all rising. All right. Σε σχέση με, το, με την άνοδο του λαϊκισμού, που είναι ένα γεγονό, ε, θα συνιστούσα να κάνουμε λίγο υπομονή να δούμε το αποτέλεσμα των ευρωεκλογών. Ε, Πολλέ φορέ ο θόρυβο ε, συγχαίρεται με το αποτέλεσμα. Εγώ προτιμώ να περιμένω το αποτέλεσμα. Ε, αυτή τη στιγμή βλέπουμε μόνο το θόρυβο. στερα θα έλεγα ότι υπάρχουν δύο ομάδε Ευρωπαίων που πρέπει να τι ξεχωρίσουμε. Υπάρχουν Ευρωπαίοι οι οποίοι έχουν γνήσιε ανησυχίε και ερωτήσει για την Ευρώπη. Ανάμεσα σε αυτού και οι μου, α πούμε. Οι οποίοι μου λένε τι κάνετε γι' αυτό, τι κάνετε για εκείνο. Ε, σε αυτού του Ευρωπαίου χρωστάμε ικανοποιητικέ απαντήσει, λύσει. Δεν θα πρέπει σε καμιά περίπτωση αυτού να του κάνουμε πακέτο με του ε, λαϊκιστέ. Υπάρχουν όμω και άλλοι, οι οποίοι απλά θέλουν να ισοπεδώσουν την Ευρώπη. Ε, αυτοί δεν ενδιαφέρονται για καμιά ε, λογική εξήγηση, δεν του νοιάζει τίποτα από όσα κάναμε μαζί. Το μόνο που του νοιάζει είναι πώ θα γκρεμίσουν όσα χτίσαμε μαζί. Το είδαμε και πρόσφατα στην Αυστρία, ορισμένου από αυτού να φτάνουν μέχρι το σημείο να συζητάνε με τρίτε δυνάμει πώ θα αλλοιώσουν ε, του θεσμού του δημοκρατικού. Αυτού του δεύτερου λοιπόν θα πρέπει να του κερδίσουμε όχι στα λόγια, αλλά στην πράξη, στην κάλπη. Πρέπει λοιπόν και στη νέα ε, δυναμική, στο νέο Ευρωπαϊκό Κοινοβούλιο, να δούμε γύρω από ποιον θα χτιστεί αυτή η νέα κοινοβουλευτική πλειοψηφία. Είναι ρητή και ρητά εκφρασμένη η, η άποψη της Ευρωπαϊκής Επιτροπής ότι εμείς είμαστε υπέρ αυτού του συστήματος. Δίνει περισσότερη ευκρίνεια, δίνει περισσότερη νομιμοποίηση, 
ε, συνδέει την Ευρώπη με ένα πρόσωπο. Εντάξει, τώρα δεν φτάσαμε στο σημείο να έχουμε τα primaries όπως ε, συμβαίνει στη ΣΥΠΑ, αλλά είναι μια πολύ σημαντική αρχή δημοκρατικής νομιμοποίησης στην Ευρώπη που πρέπει να την κρατήσουμε, δεν πρέπει να χαθεί. All right, one thing that struck me there when he said about populism is that uh, there's a lot more noise than result. Do you think he actually believes it? That the, the, he, the, he, is he confident in what he's saying? I think he's not convinced so much about uh, he's the size. He's, he's convinced. He thinks that, of course, populism is rising, but he's not sure that the, no that the noise is at the same level as the real uh, result in the end, that the people mm -hmm. will go to vote. Of course, these populist parties will rise, but the level and the size uh, of this is not really what he believes that uh, the media also well, we will uh, shows find that out pretty soon in just a few days actually all right let's move on a month after ukrainians went to the polls its new celebrity president was sworn in this morning and he didn't waste any time getting down to business let's take a look remember him he's the comedian turned politician who's been causing a storm in ukraine after a campaign featuring tigers, drug tests, and that awkward empty podium, today the actor who played the president in a TV sitcom became president for real after a landslide victory in last month's election. No stranger to the spotlight, he stepped into the presidential palace, a man with a plan. And no sooner was he officially sworn in, announced some sweeping changes. As well as vowing to end the conflict with Russian-backed rebels in the east of the country. Replacing former President Petro Poroshenko, Mr. Zelensky has promised a war on corruption and a pro-Western path. But for neighboring Russia, Ukraine's new president isn't a laughing matter. And amid ongoing tensions between the two, a Kremlin spokesperson says Mr. Putin has no plans to congratulate Mr. Zelensky. So he's already dis dissolved parliament and he wants uh, to fight corruption, etc. But what are you watching out for when, when looking at Ukraine? Well, I think I'm going to be watching out for the relationship with Russia. I mean, this mm -hmm. is what's probably more significant. Everyone is focused on this, you know, he's, a, he's an actor, he's a comedian. I mean, and yes, of course, we live in now the era of, you know, reality TV politicians yeah. and politicians. But I think it'll be much more interesting to see what he can deliver going forward when he is kind of past this current big rush mm. of, of support. All right. OK, so a lot more coming up. We have our red couch. It's been across the EU hearing your concerns ahead of this week's elections. And now it is in Germany for the home stretch. What are voters there concerned about? That is up next. Welcome back to Raw Politics. Now, throughout the EU election campaign, Euronews has been on a road trip across Europe, trying to find out what really matters to voters. Now, later this week, that journey will wrap up right here in Brussels. But tonight, we find our very own Maeve McMahon still on the road and in the German city of Munster. Maeve, good to see you there. So what have people been telling you? What's on their mind? What, what concerns them? Well, the first thing, Tessa, to note is people here in Germany are very much aware that elections are taking place this weekend and they're planning to vote, apart from one British Erasmus student we met earlier today who didn't actually realise that her country will be participating in the upcoming European elections. But these elections, like in many EU countries, they feel a little bit more like national elections and these particular ones feel like a litmus test for the coalition government of Angela Merkel. Now, yesterday in Berlin, we saw thousands of people come to the street calling for a message of hope and change but a little bit outside the capital city well the picture was a little bit different and we decided to go off the beaten track and stop by at a football match one that was taking place between Magdeburg and Cologne and most people they frankly did not want to talk about politics and when I mentioned the word Brussels or Strasbourg or e-institutions their eyes rolled and they told me politics and politicians do not really represent them and they feel very far away let's take a little bit a little look at this report we put together dass das Ganze alles mal ein bisschen äh, wieder realisiert wird, dass das also zurückgenommen wird, dass wir auch wieder mehr Mitspracherecht haben, dass alles gleich verteilt ist und sowas. Puh, was ist wichtig? Wichtig ist das da oben zum Beispiel. Also alles, was in die Richtung Kinder geht. 
Würden Sie dann am Sonntag wählen? Ja. ja. AfD. AfD, warum? Ja. Weiß kein. Äh, was für Sachen sind wichtig? Ähm, auf jeden Fall die Nachhaltigkeit, ähm, auch der ähm, Gedanke des Europas, äh, des gemeinsamen Europas und natürlich alles, was äh, nicht mit Recht zu tun hat. Für uns ist das genauso wichtig wie für alle Menschen in Europa, dass wir in gesicherten, friedlichen Verhältnissen leben können. Das ist wichtig. Now, that football match was taking place in Magdeburg, which is an eastern German town, about two hours outside Berlin, where a couple of years ago the AFD, the alternative for Germany, started to do very, very well. It was different where we were this morning in Bremen, which is in north Germany. There the socialists have been in power for the last 73 years, something that could change this Sunday in the European elections and also because the mayor will also be put to the test because local elections are taking place. But there we put the red sofa out and a number of people approached us and spoke to us. They were all feeling very uh, excited, if you like, about these European elections, calling for more unity, saying that one needs to work together in this global world. And we spoke to one young man called Mohammed, who came to Germany a couple of years ago. He's from Syria, he's learned German, and he said that Bremen is now his second home. He feels very much at home and very much welcomed here in Germany. He said he can't vote, he said, unfortunately, this Sunday, but if he could, and he, he would. Right. Thank you very much for that, uh, Maeve McMahon, there on uh, that last stretch of our road trip. All right, back with us in the studio is Risha Kuschler, yeah. journalist with Svenska Degladet, and still with me, Jennifer Baker and Darren McCaffrey. All right, Darren, we've been talking about this um, throughout, you know, this whole election process. It's the disconnect between people and, and, and politicians mm -hmm. and politics in general. I mean, we saw that in many parts of that road trip that Euronews was Yeah, it's done. extraordinary, isn't it, kind of listening to that voter there in Germany talking about taking control back, mm -hmm. a message we've heard uh, elsewhere, a message, of course, that uh, Donald Trump has played on the United States about the disconnect with Washington and the rest of the country. And it is this sense that people have felt, whether in the aftermath of the financial crisis, whether because, you know, there has been a large scale of migration uh, to many parts of Europe, uh, or indeed emigration from other parts, that people feel that they have kind of slightly lost mm. control of what they had known. Uh, and with the pace of change, uh, only accentuating that that is potentially likely to get worse. And politicians are struggling with that, how to give people that sense of control. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is, are people going to be engaged in these elections? Do they care enough to vote? Uh, do they care much? enough to vote? Because ultimately, when you look at every single EU election since 1979, the graph of people voting is downwards, mm -hmm. with the lowest turnout last time round. This time might actually be different. Bizarrely. We'll have to wait and see. We'll have to wait. Theresa, I want to I say something, yeah. but also the debate has been getting more heated and it feels like there's a slightly bit more involvement. I don't know. What do you think? I thought it was very strange to hear from a German woman that she wants to take control back because when you're from a small country like I am, you say we want to take control back from those Germans because those <laughs> they rule. Right. The French and the Germans with small countries like well, yours this is or mine, we want to take control back. between city and rural areas, I suppose, <laughs> so, maybe, yeah, you know, yeah, the difference between yeah. capitals and, and smaller yeah, areas. What do you mm. think? What is the feeling for you? Uh, I think the, what we really want to watch is how people actually get out and vote. We spoke a little bit earlier about social media, I think the big danger is that there will be misinformation campaigns to stop mm. people going to the polls. There'll be stories saying, oh, that polling station is closed, don't go there. I really think that is a big danger. Uh, you know, it's, mm -hmm. it was a method used by Trump to try and suppress vote in certain areas and increase it in others. And that, right. that bothers me. That, that's my biggest worry. People should vote how they truly feel. But really, mm -hmm. I just think more, the turnout is more important at this point. Right. Well, you the can vote from the 23rd of May to the, to the 26th, 26th, depending on where you are. <laughs> well, there you go. Euronews.com. OK, well, this week we look back at some of our more memorable road trip stops as we were doing uh, earlier. Our correspondents took that inflatable red couch to the picturesque town of Viverone in northern Italy. But the people there said that the natural beauty masks a whole host of issues. Let's take a look. I left in 1999. It's always quite sad for me to come back in the area because the, um, I don't see much changing. Um, it's a beautiful area. Um, a lot could be done with it. But um, a little bit is uh, the stubbornness of people, and some is uh, <laughs> the corruption of the government, it has to be said, um, that always makes it uh, difficult for change. The most important issue is jobs, because there's a lot of unemployment, and you know it very well. And together with this, we have a bunch of incompetents in the government who are in charge. 
Monti che governa questo paese. They thought it was just sufficient to get into power and using propaganda to resolve problems, but as we can see, it didn't work. Come si vede non è così. Concerning the economy, the situation in Italy is very difficult. I see many problems because they let entrepreneurs leave the country. And they are the people who drive the economy and they create employment. If you let them leave, it's clear there is unemployment and no job creation. Uh, for younger people, they, they were born in Europe and they don't know anything else but, but Europe. For them it's, it's, it's quite normal to, to travel wherever they want to go to and they don't make a big difference between Italy or France. They, I have many friends that have been working all over Europe uh, already with 25 uh, years of age. And, uh, but I think older people m might be more attached to where they come from. Well, those are just some of the diverse voices we heard uh, from people across Europe, and we're always interested in what you have to say. That's why coming up, we want to hear what you care about. What are you, your biggest concerns in the EU elections, and do you care enough to vote? We want to hear what you think. Now, your call is coming up at 7 p.m. Brussels time. That contact information is on your screen. You can call us at 00800-3333-7002. You get in on the debate using the hashtag RawPolitics. And our lines are opening soon, just after the break. This is Raw Politics, your call. Will the EU be over in 20 years? No, in one word, no, definitely not. I think it'll be over much quicker than that. Why? I think it'll be collapsed because of the unsustainable economic structure. We can now join Peter. There's absolutely no question in my mind that the EU will still be around in 20 years' time. Should electric scooters be banned? I think it's a clean, green innovation, and we should make the most of it. Well, those were last week's highlights from Your Politics, Your Call. And we're doing it all over again tonight at the usual time of 7 p.m. Brussels time and 6 p.m. if you're in the U.K. and Ireland. And Darren is hosting with our Brussels correspondent, uh, Jack Parrick. And they will be joined by Theresa Kushler and Jennifer Baker, who are with us here also on the sofas. OK, Darren, so what are we talking about tonight? No electric scooters <laughs> tonight, I promise. Uh, I knew you'd react that, to that. That rant has been had. Um, we're going to be talking about engagement in EU politics, uh, essentially whether you can be bothered to turn out and vote uh, this weekend. Do you really care that much? Because it's interesting, when you look at all these protests mm. and you see, like, 10,000 people in Milan, at the end of the day, they're all a bit strange. Most people don't do political protests, but do most people vote? Mm. And also, uh, we were talking about Nigel Farage a little bit earlier on, mm -hmm. uh, with uh, a smile on his face. He may not well have a smile on his face tonight. We'll explain why. Let's have a look <laughs> at some of those hot topics coming up on tonight's programme. Hidden cameras, Russian oligarchs and alleged bribery. A political scandal that surfaced in Austria over the weekend has it all. And it's forced Chancellor Sebastian Kurz to call for snap elections in September. In a secretly taped video, the leader of Kurz's far-right coalition partner appears to be offering public contracts in exchange for party donations from a woman he believed to be a wealthy niece of a Russian oligarch. And it's got us wondering, is political corruption in Europe getting worse? Two rallies with two competing messages. In Italy, thousands showed up on Saturday to support Europe's nationalist leaders who gathered in Milan, united against Brussels. Whereas in Germany, thousands of pro-EU demonstrators came together to protest against nationalism. Those who attended rallies clearly care about the outcome of the European elections. But with voter turnout continuing to decline over the past four decades, we want to know, do you care enough to vote? The latest protest trend in the UK, launching milkshakes of politicians you don't like. It's forced police in Scotland to order McDonald's to stop selling them ahead of a rally hosted by Nigel Farage. But that didn't stop others in the north of England managing to attack the Brexit party leader. 
This follows a string of similar incidents in recent weeks. And it comes two months after an Australian teenager shot to internet fame for egging a far-right politician over comments he made about Muslims in the wake of the Christchurch shooting. We want to know, when do political protests go too far? So come on, Europe, have your say. Is political corruption in Europe getting worse? Do you care enough to vote? And when do political protests go too far? You know what to do, uh, get in touch, pick up the phone, it is free at 00800 333 uh, You can also email us at rawpoll at euronews.com. Uh, join us on Skype, we always love to see your face. Uh, use the handle Raw Politics, or indeed if you're on Facebook on Twitter, hashtag Raw Politics. Yes, interesting questions tonight. I think what we'd like to talk about now is that, you know, when political protests go too far, because you were talking about the Nigel Farage uh, milkshake yeah. uh, throw today. Um, yeah, it's not, was... it's not the first time, uh, not just that incident in Australia we mentioned just then as well, but also where uh, Jeremy Corbyn, the British Labour Party leader, mm -hmm. uh, got egged. And the question is, uh, yes, it might seem funny and it amuses people because they don't like these politicians, but at the end of the day, it shows how exposed politicians mm -hmm. are. And mm -hmm. whatever you think of them, they are doing their job, they're trying to track people's votes. And, you know, it can go from a very fine line of milkshakes and eggs to something that's a bit more violent. Mm. Uh, and given that we've seen political assassinations in many parts of Europe over the last couple of decades, I think we all need to be concerned mm. that just because the person you don't like gets egged one day if that is is not, should not, not be mm. promotion sure. for kind of a funny kind of glee. So on where is stage. the line? Where is the line there? Well, when it comes to political protests. I mean, yeah, milkshakes and eggs. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I mean, if you thought this sort of current wave, if you like, of milkshake that we see um, was sort of started off by a young man who was goaded into throwing a milkshake over Tommy Robinson, mm. Stephen Axley mm. Lennon uh, in the UK. And, I mean, if you look at that full video, you know, he was just happened to have a milkshake that he was drinking mm. and was pushed and pushed and pushed to the point where he just went. Mm. That is very understandable. It's a very human reaction. I think we can all understand and be there. There's a, there's a McDonald's in Scotland. It's not going to sell milkshakes, mm -hmm. but, you know, it's more... you, can, you can prevent the milkshakes being sold, but people have the wit to go out and buy eggs, I think. <laughs> yeah, what, what do you think, Tisa? I, I remember in Sweden, uh, politicians, and including the king, were, were, they were caked. Uh -huh. And I remember one incident when the finance minister walked from one building to the next. It was tradition, they walked with the budget, the yearly budget, to present it. So there was a walk and the cameras would follow, and then all of a sudden somebody throws a cake in his face. And I remember seeing that humiliation, that mm. he was bubbling inside. He had spent a year on that budget, and he was caked for it. It I, is I, weird. I there is this rich tradition it. of kind of cakes and eggs and milk. And yeah, custard, pies. But I think given the fervour you... where politics is now, <laughs> I don't know, I think, I think we should go that. It's an interesting conversation. No. What do you think? Do get in touch. All that uh, information is now on your screen. You can uh, call us uh, for free at 00800. There you go. 3333-7002. And you can email us at rawpaul at uh, euronews.com. And on social media, use the hashtag raw politics and you can look for us on Skype as well. So join in that conversation. If you agree, disagree, what do you think? All right, now, before we go, as Europe's politicians make a last chance bid for victory ahead of EU elections, perhaps they should take some tips from the Indian Prime Minister mm -hmm. Narendra Modi and set aside some me time. Yes or no, Darren, do politicians have to be doing, should be doing that here? Uh, yes. Ah. I do it every evening <laughs> after the show. Well, there you go. <laughs> OK. OK, so we would love to hear your views. Tell us what you think about everything that we've talked about. Uh, do let us know your, your opinions. Go on social media. We're everywhere there. Use the hashtag RawPolitics and stay tuned for your call after the show.